he really likes to ride bikes, and real bikes, when, when you have to do some effort, and it's uh, another nice thing. And he, it's amazing how he takes real care of his wife. So it's amazing. So, so this is three qualities that you did not know about him. So, uh, yeah. He knows a lot about him. Yeah, and he knows about him. Mm -hmm. So rough, you can see him. Everything about him. <coughs> Uh, so the uh, design patterns, the book Design Patterns, came out uh, 20 years ago as at, at Uppsala. Um, and the first plot was the same time, actually. Uh, plot was in September, and Uppsala was in October. So in fact, plot came out about one month before uh, the core design patterns. So if you say, some people think, well, design patterns sort of in, uh, caused plot to happen, that, that's not true. Uh, but you know, we had draft copies, we had you know, printed copies uh, that we had printed ourselves because we didn't have them from the publisher yet. We had copies of people to read. There had been a meeting about a year earlier where uh, Kent Beck had organized this. He was trying to get people more excited about patterns. He wanted patterns to become uh, you know, a movement, a thing, and to change computer science. He had a lot of ideas about that. And, and so you recently did that event. So at that time, uh, we were already working on the book, uh, but we had a meeting. And you know, all these people interested in patterns, why aren't we all writing more about patterns? And I think Warren Cunningham was the one who said, I don't write about it because where would I publish it? There's no place to put it. And we said, we should have a conference. And so, uh, so that was, we should have a conference. That was the motivation to start a plot. And so anyway, there's a, a strong connection historically because the book came out and was very, very successful. And because it was very, very successful, it attracted a lot of people to patterns, conferences, and to plot. So there's, there's a very a strong connection, a very strong connection between design patterns and, and plot. But you know, to say that one of them caused the other is not true. They had those sort of similar things, there's similar events that caused both of them. Uh, to, to happen. Now, so the book says on it, if you read it, the copyright is 1995. One of the interesting things I've learned is that publishers like to actually put later dates, like later copyright dates on it, the book that actually kind of came out, because especially for technical literature, uh, people want a, a book to be new and relevant, and so having that later date gives you like a year longer that you can, you can sell it. Uh, so, of course, for this book, it's completely irrelevant because 20 years later, here we're still selling this book. Usually they get two or three years on a technical book. Uh, and uh, so this was my, my first book, which is, which is a sort of a completely unusual, atypical. This is not the way technical books work. Uh, what happened for it, but it's been a, a, great, uh, a great experience. The book has won lots of awards. And uh, some of them, like the, the Software Engineering Award made more sense to me than the Programming Language Award. Uh, now, when, when <coughs> I was told we were reading the programming, because it's not a book about programming languages at all, right? It's a book about programming. It's a book about, you know, in some sense, object-oriented programming, but not really from a language perspective. It's, it's from a, a programming perspective, a design perspective. <coughs> and I, as I was trying to think, why did they do that? The first thought was, well, they give out an award every year, and they usually give out an award to work that was presented at, at POPL, or uh, PLDI. Uh, these are SIGPLAN, a SIGPLAN Special Interest Group on Programming Languages of the ACM. So they're giving them out to these conferences that they, well, what's the biggest conference that SIGPLAN organizes? Well, it turns out it's Oopsla. Oops, that was it, and this big auditorium conference, which some of the papers were about programming languages and some of them weren't. You know, it always seems sort of a funny conference. But what's, uh, you know, they didn't really have paper. I was wondering whether they were giving us the award just to sort of be fair to Uppsala and, and give an award to something that was big at Uppsala, in which case it's sort of a, of a uh, the, 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 the term in, in uh, in America is um, uh, <laughs> I think the, 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 the term is key. But we're, we're just trying to be fair to everybody and you know give give things out. But but the other side is that the book actually had a big impact on theory 
uh, programming languages and work in the object-oriented web. Because when you look at papers before the book who were talking about type theory, and they would be <coughs> saying, uh, you know, what's a good example of object-oriented programming? They would have really stupid examples like, well, we have a two-dimensional point, and we're going to make a subclass, which is a three-dimensional point, but we're going to add on a, a, a Z uh, coordinate to it. And that's just not at all typical of object -oriented, of how inheritance gets used in object -oriented. After the book came out, people would use the composite pattern. And they would, they would and the composite is a much more interesting use of inheritance. And a lot of the type systems couldn't handle that. So you, you had to, they, basically, the patterns, because they are showing these sort of little core ideas or core techniques in object -oriented programming, they made better use, uh, they made better examples for the, for the theoreticians when they were, uh, so, so maybe that was the reason. I, I always wonder when you get an award, the, let's say, you don't really know what was going on. Is it also politics? Because uh, IBM wanted uh, the other three people, um, Eric Gama, Richard Helm, and John Basides were all working at IBM. I was the only non-IBMer uh, uh, in, in the book. <laughs> uh, so uh, IBM was actually trying to get people who were uh, who were done work at IBM to get awards. So, so I know that that was part of, of, of that. There's always politics going on with any of these, these nominations. But uh, so one of the things that I've been happiest about the book is the you know, sort of the impact on patterns, how lots of other things have come out. So some of it was very directly related to design patterns. One of the very first books was uh, the first one up there, Design Patterns Small Talk Companion, written by three guys at IBM uh, who are small talk programmers. And they were, um, in, if you look at design patterns, most of the examples, most of the code is in C++. But there is a fair bit of code in small talk. And I wrote all the small talk code. So I was you know, more of a small talk guy in the group. Uh, but in fact, small talk was big at IBM at that time. It's not anymore, because it was, it was back then. And, they were trying to show how, for each of the patterns, they were giving more examples and we trying to show this. And we thought at the time there'd be a lot of books, I think there have been books, showing for some particular programming language how the design patterns work out in that language. Because the idea behind the design patterns was that they were not specific to one language. They were, they were design ideas that were fairly low level, so they were close to the programming language. Uh, but uh, but still, they were they were about object-oriented programming rather than C++, and that you should be able to see them in other languages. And uh, I think proof of that is Java, which wasn't invented when the book came out. The book came out in the fall of '84, and Java got released to the world in spring uh, uh, fall of '94. Java got released to the world in spring of '95. <coughs> And when you look at the libraries, even the very early libraries, libraries from 95 and 96, which is design pattern stuff all through them. So, uh, you know, that's so one of the recent books is this Head's First, is it, how many people have seen Head's First Design Patterns? So this is a, a very cool book. Uh, it's written in a, a style that appears to uh, Young people, I, I, I suppose I'd say there's a lot of cartoons, there's games, no crossword puzzles, and all sorts of different stuff. But I could never write a book like that. I actually get annoyed reading books like that. If I wanted to learn some, some technology, I wouldn't learn it from a book like that. But I can recognize that that's a very appealing group to a book to, for, for young people. And that people, they, the authors really know their stuff. They are teaching very, very good content. They understand it very well and doing a great job teaching it. So as all kinds of, of books get written. And that's one of the things <coughs> when you are an author and you're trying to get an idea out, you know you're successful when other people take it and they do something new with it. They take it in ways that you couldn't have taken it. That's that sort of success. You, you have to give it away. You have to get other people to take it and do something new with it that you can't do in order for it to really be successful. Um, now there's other books that are in other kind of patterns. Uh, my favorite patterns book is not mine. It's uh, Domain Driven Design by Eric Evans. Uh, how many people have read that book? It's a, it's a great software book 
about, uh, I'd say, higher level things than design patterns, uh, more a lot of software architecture. The key idea in the book is that it's sort of this object-oriented idea that when we're programming, our software our, our, uh, is, is supposed to be a model <coughs> of something. So if you're building banking applications, then your software is a model of banks. And if you're doing advertising, you your model, your software is a model of, of the advertising world. And the problem, and so your, your class diagrams, class structures, classes, what you do, are supposed to be represent things, you want to say, in the real world, as if banking is real or, or advertising is real, but somehow programming is not real. You know, it's all they're all different aspects of, of reality. But but you know we are we have our customers, and to them programming is not important. To them, you know, advertising, or banking, or whatever that's what's important. So you try to make your objects be related you know, to to what they do, and this has the advantage you can have good conversations. You can talk to them about the software, and they understand it because you use their vocabulary. One of the points he makes is that, in fact, there's things you have to talk about that they don't have a vocabulary. It isn't going to be their vocabulary. It's going to be all of your vocabulary. You have to have a whole group together. You have to make up a vocabulary that all of you can work with. And the business people are very important. I mean, your customers are very important. But then you, know, you as developer, you're important too. And all of you together have to make this vocabulary. And he talks about that. It's very closely related to refactoring and to you know, ideas from agile development, how all this fits in, because you're constantly changing your design as you work on it, and how do you keep it all. Um, and you, but also, uh, when you get a big system, there's many parts, and you can't keep all the parts in sync. And so you have to, how do the different parts, how do the groups that develop the different parts work together? Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's my favorite patterns book. And one of the things I like about it is that it doesn't have pattern in the title. He never has a, a chapter in there. This is what a pattern is. Half the chapters are descriptions of patterns, and half the chapters are just stories of how you solve problems, what the world is like, and gives examples of using the patterns. But it's in some, so much a patterns book that he doesn't talk about patterns. They, they just are. They, they just are. And he also tried to copy Christopher Alexander's writing style which is maybe not the best thing. Sometimes it works better than others, but it has lots of pictures. And it's a very, very interesting book. It's artistic. It's artistic book. And so there are uh, some very good user interface design pattern, pattern books, which are also very artistic. Uh, I'm not very artistic myself, so I, I admire these books that are, that are artistic. Um, and more, so Martin Fowler, of course, has written many, uh, many good books. And some of them are, are very strong patterns books. And uh, this one, Patterns of Enterprise Application Architecture, is if you're building business systems, large object-oriented business systems, it's a really great book with lots of, of patterns that uh, fit in there. Um, and of course, the Hillside group keeps um, a list of books. Not all, unfortunately, uh, there's a lot of, so, so um, Eric Evans, when he wrote his book, he did that using Plop. He brought, he came to Plop like four years in a row, bringing chapters, getting, finding that Plop people who would read the book and talk to him, and he used Plop to help him make the book good. A lot of people write patterns books, and then they don't go to Plop. I and mean, we sometimes surprised to discover a book that has appeared, and there really wasn't any uh, any connection. So you know, it's not necessary people to be, be working uh, through plot but That's sort of the purpose of uh, Hillside Group and, and, and Plot is to, um, is to you know, get, get these patterns out for people to do that. OK, so design patterns. <clears throat> it's really just a pattern. Uh, we often talk about making pattern languages. It's not a pattern language. We didn't try to make it be a pattern language. We had no idea how to do that. So, so we were trying to do what we knew how to do. We were trying to pick patterns that we thought were typical of advanced object-oriented programming. And when we wrote the book, we figured that anybody who was an expert at object-oriented programming would read our book and say, yep, yep, that's a, that's a pattern, that's a pattern, that's a pattern. And they would say, well, I didn't really learn anything reading the book. That's all stuff I know. But people, our target audience, was someone 
who had been programming in C++ for maybe two years and had just discovered they were not really doing object-oriented programming. There were a lot of people like that back in the mid-90s. And, and so they wanted to learn these, these techniques. And so we were, were trying to put them together in a way people could learn. And a, a key part of the, the purpose of the book was to provide this design vocabulary. The patterns themselves, the names of the patterns, were this vocabulary. They are the names you use to talk about your designs. And they were supposed to, I mean, I, the goal was to make uh, good for learning. You sort of learn one pattern at a time, learn what each technique means. Uh, then you can talk to other people about your designs by, by describing the, the design in terms of the patterns that you're using. That would be more efficient than just having for each technique to sort of use, you know, talk about the individual classes that are in it. And also to help you design, because when you're designing, you often get stuck. You're not quite sure what to do. And it's nice if you could have some alternatives. Think about it this way, or this way, or this way. And I'll, do, I'll run down different patterns and imagine, what would it be like if I were to use this pattern? Or if I use this pattern? Or if I use this pattern? And of course, often you say, what would it be like? You say, nah, that wouldn't be very good. Well, what about this one? Ah, that wouldn't be good. What about this one? That might be useful. And just having the ideas that let you try out things, uh, it's, it's helpful for, for designing. So when we wrote the book, we had 23 patterns, and we made a list of 23 patterns, and we said, that's awful. A list of 23 things. You, you don't want to look at a list of 23 things. So we tried to organize it, and we had six different categories. <coughs> Well, we tried to organize everything in these categories, and we actually, one of the categories had nothing in it. We were trying to be logical about how we did that. We eventually ended up with three categories, um, and these categories in the book are the creational patterns, the behavioral patterns, and the uh, structural patterns. Now, many people think that there's something magical about these categories, and they aren't. We just, 23 was too many. And, we, and, and we, we had to break it down into smaller uh, sections. Actually, like seven is a very good number, but uh, it didn't divide quite so nicely. Uh, looking back at that, the creational patterns is a good category. I can tell every pattern, I can say this is creational, this is not creational. But behavioral and structural are not very good categories because a number of the patterns could be structural, they could be behavioral. Which one should I put them in? Well, you've got to put them in one, so just, just okay, it's going to be like this. And it's not, it's, they're not very good categories in terms of being able to um, remember. Um, so we were trying to think, what's a better way to organize that? Um, so one of the things, the, the four of us got together, um, I'm trying to remember when it was. It was like something like eight years ago. Uh, John Lacides was very ill, uh, and he actually died about six months after this time. He had cancer. And we, and we knew he, he, had or, he had organized this meeting because he was always very optimistic and you know, hoping that he would be able to uh, you know, keep going. So he had organized and he got everybody else to come. And we, we all went to New York, close to where he lived. And then by the time we actually got there, he was so sick. He was in the hospital. He couldn't even come to our meeting. So we went and visited him. But the three of us talked about what should the next edition of the book be like. How should it change? And one of the things we agreed on is these three categories, not useful. They just are not really useful for teaching, for remembering, for helping other people find patterns and put them in. And when you read early plot papers, you'll see a lot of people who try to categorize their patterns according to our three categories, which is just silly. They're, they're not good categories. What are good categories? Well, one way we thought would be for teaching. People always want to know what are the important patterns and which ones are like not so important. So we decided that we ought to have what we call them core patterns. Because we could tell it, we have an idea. These things are important and these other ones, you know, maybe not so important. And so we, we decided to, uh, to have core uh, patterns that's what we thought were important. And the ones in bold face are the ones in the book, uh, value object and null object are ones that are not in the book. They're, they're in italics. These are ones that have been talked about. There have been a null object. It was one of the very first plots 
uh, and it's been written several times. A value object is a funny pattern because um, I can remember before design patterns even came out, Kent Beck writing value object. We tried to write, and a lot of people tried to write it, and then we'd, after we'd write the pattern, we'd say, it just isn't right. This isn't what value object really is. Somehow we're missing the purpose of it. So it was a part of the vocabulary. Lots of people talked about this pattern, and it took a long time to actually write it up. In fact, I'd say Eric Evans' book is the first one to really have a good description of a value object. So uh, anyway, I would, I would like to take a crack at that and you know, write my own version of a value object. Now that I've learned from Eric how to, how to do it. <laughs> Uh, but uh, but we, we think that would uh, should be in the book. <laughs> and it's, it's, a, it's a key pattern. So an example, and one of the um, my favorite patterns, people say, you know, what's the most important pattern or the most commonly used pattern? I, I don't know, but my favorite pattern, my favorite pattern is always a composite pattern. And that's because when I'm designing a system and I can figure out how to put composite in it, Often it seems that's a, a special time in the history of the design. But now suddenly the design becomes much more composable, and I can uh, I can extend it a lot more easily. And there's no real reason why it has to be that way. It's just a number of times when I've been designing systems, the the time that I was able to figure out how the composite pattern got in was sort of a time that the design seemed to be more successful. So so it's uh, maybe it's superstition or it's just you know, accident or or, or whatever. It's hard hard to tell. But I always have a a special feeling about composite. So, what's the composite pattern? And, uh, and, and how many people, you know, uh, you know, think they know what the composite pattern is? So, over half the people don't. That's 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 interesting. Okay. So, the composite pattern uh, is um, is you you're, you're building uh, an, an object design, and you are having. Uh, Complicated objects, objects with parts. One object com contains another object. And often you have trees of objects. And maybe you're doing uh, music. And so you have a single note, but you also could have a whole phrase. You could have a chord. And you say, well, if you think of something like an abstract sound, a note is a sound, and a chord is a sound, and a, a sequence of notes or chords is a sound. But yet, so this. The sequence or the chord are composites because you define the, the, the sequence or the chord from these smaller sounds. And so this is an idea that you have a, a, a notion of a composite as a general idea uh, that works in lots of different fields. So when you're trying to model that in object oriented programming, the, a classic way you do that is we'll say we'll have this component, so like sound, and then we say, well, a sound might have children, they might have other components. So this is um, so using um, a UML style notation, and, and you say that a, a component has these other components that are related to it, you, you call it their, their children. It has to the star means it can be uh, zero to many. So a, a, a component can have zero to many other components. Now, this is, imagine we're doing a book, and then a book uh, can be made up of chapters, and chapters are made up of of uh, sections and subsections all the way down to a paragraph or a figure um, and all of these are like parts of a book, components of a book. So imagine you're doing that. Um, and and, and I, I've seen plenty of, of designs that are like this. This is not quite composite. This is not what the book says you ought to do composite. But because the problem with this and, and what the book, the, the, the version of composite in the book is, is solving is that one of these components will be the smallest thing, and it can't have components. Something has to be the smallest. Now, maybe I say paragraph is the smallest. So maybe you say, no, no, but paragraphs are made up of sentences. OK, sentences. No, no, sentences are made up of words. Then words are smallest. No, 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 words are made up of characters. But then paragraphs are made up of Something has to be the smallest. Right? Something has to be the smallest. And when you're designing, you get to choose. You might say, well, a uh, paragraph is the smallest, and a paragraph has a string as its contents, and a string is not a component. Because I mean, most programming languages, like Java, string is already in the language, so you don't, and, and string in the language is not a component. You know, it's up to you as a programmer. You get to decide, but something has to be the smallest. And whatever is the smallest can't really have components. And when you work with a library that does it this way, 
you will, by mistake, I guarantee you, I guarantee you that by mistake, you will give the smallest thing, which cannot have a component, you will give the component, because this design says that every one of these kind of objects can have children. So you will take the smallest thing, which can't have a component, but you'll by mistake give it a component, and something weird will happen when you do that. But the system isn't going to, to enter. What you can do is put in extra code to check that and try to prevent it from happening. But I learned this the hard way in Smalltalk, in the original Smalltalk 80, using model view controller. And it did this. Uh, all views could have subviews. But a button view could not really have. And, and a, a paragraph view, which is looking at a single paragraph, that wasn't really supposed to have a subview. And I learned this was you know, before the days of uh, being able to to do a screen capture and send it, it was a text-only email back in, say, 89. Text-only email was all we had then. I could debug graphical user interfaces by email. People would say, oh, I had this problem. And I just, it was the same. Everybody did the same mistake over and over again. And I could, I could just, you know, by text-only email, I could, I could debug their graphical user interfaces because they all did the same mistake. And, that, and, and a design like this leads you into that. So the real composite pattern is that we have this component class and we have different types of subclasses. So we have leaves, the so things that cannot have components, and then you have composites, which are the, the classes that can have them. So uh, we, if you are doing um, graphical user interfaces and views, then you have the views that have components and the views that can't have components, and you, you keep them set. Now, but one of the keys is that these type of, of objects, these classes, are supposed to have the same interface as much as possible. You want them to have the same interface. And there are certain things that always become problems, and the, you know, the book talks about them when you, when you try to do this. But uh, you need to be able to iterate over your children, and when you ask the leap, uh, iterate over your children, it's easy, they have no children, so iteration does nothing. Uh, and it's these sort of classic issues that come up every time where you're using composite, whether you're doing it for user interfaces or for music or for banking or you know, whatever it is you're trying to do. So another pattern is the observer pattern. And the observer pattern is that we have some objects that uh, that change state. Something happens to change them. And we have other objects that are trying to depend on them. So the classic way is that these first objects, the ones that change state, are part of your application data. And then the objects that depend on them are part of the user interface. And so when you change, say we're editing some piece of mail, and when we change that piece of mail, we want the screen that's a picture of the mail to change automatically. And, and this pattern gets used in pretty much every single user interface framework out there. And in Java, uh, they're called listeners instead of observer. That's the same, it's the exact same pattern. Um, so one of the things that's interesting about every implementation of this pattern uh, is that uh, we, we say there's these two types of objects. In the books, calls them subjects. So subject is the thing that your has state and you're interested in, it will change. And then the observer, and the observer depends on the subject, and when the subject changes, the observer needs to be notified. And so sometimes you talk about the uh, um, uh, event notification. Uh, Microsoft calls this publish subscribe. So this is a sort of idea that shows up and people have different names for it. So then you make, so this is a, the abstract. We have <laughs> subjects, the things you look at, observers, the things doing the looking and they have to change. And then we make uh, concrete subclasses of them. So here is a typical you know, Chicago gangster model. So you've got uh, these gangsters who are going to be robbing the bank. And you have FBI agents. And we're thinking back in the 20s, the, 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 the 1920s, not the 2020s. We're almost in the 2020s, but the 1920s. And so they're looking at them with binoculars and in early wiretapping of telephones and stuff like that. So they're, they're observing them. And so uh, when the mobsters are going to go to rob a bank or they're going to drive a getaway car, they're going to perform some action, 
Uh, the FBI agents are you know, trying to spot that. Of course, they might not be looking, so that the, the robbers might get away with it, or maybe they're being observed. Uh, part of the model is that subjects never know if anything is observing them. And you don't know how many are observing them. And this turns out to be useful in programming because you can add more observers easily. And when you use the observer pattern, it makes it easy. But what you have to do, um, so, so if you're going to use this pattern, there are going to be uh, these, uh, these classes, sort of subject and observer, that are reusable. Uh, actually, observer is really, in Java terms, it's an interface, not really a class. It just means you have this update operation. You will subclass to make uh, mobsters in these operations. And when uh, they perform an operation, like rob bank or drive car, when you implement that, they have to make sure that you notify that you call an operation that will uh, like change, a changed operation will, will call the update on the observers. And when, a, when an observer, if you made this FBI agent and an observer, and it's going to observe a lobster, it calls operations like add dependent, uh, and remove dependent to set up that dependency. At runtime, at runtime, the subject is going to have a list of observers. And this is what's really weird. So you think of FBI agents and mobsters, it means that every mobster has a sort of list of all the FBI agents that's looking at them. Hmm. That doesn't make sense at all. That's just wrong. You know, the whole point is they don't know who's looking at them. But from an implementation point of view, it has to be that way. Because when they change, they have to notify, they have to run down this list of observers. Now, what often happens is you make a mobster, you, you know, the, 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 the variable that holds the list could be private. You, can, you, you can't access it from a programming point of view. You can't actually access it. But if you're in a debugger and you're looking at the whole system, yeah, it's got to be there somewhere. And, and if you think about you know, how you can program, how else are you going to make this happen in programming? There, there really isn't any way. It, it's got to be like this. Uh, anyway, so it's a very, a very popular pattern. Uh, <coughs> so these are patterns that are in the book. Um, I gave a talk at, uh, at Plop on the observer pattern where I basically said that when you look at how the world has changed and how people use the observer pattern, it's, it's gone in a lot of directions that the book didn't, didn't predict. And I was trying to say there's all these, whenever you talk about a pattern, you try to be general, you try to say, well, you could do it like this, or you could do it like this, or you could do it like this. And I said, well, this is how people really are doing it 20 years from now. Did we predict how people would do it? And often I have to say, no, we didn't really predict that. And in some cases I can say, but I actually saw code 20 years ago that did it this way. Why didn't we write about it in the book? Why didn't, you know, we, we shouldn't be able to predict that better because I actually saw people do that 20 years ago. And it's, it's funny, you, you, hindsight is always 20-20. That's, that's an American uh, saying, hindsight is always a 20-20 vision. You have very good eyesight that you have 20-20 vision. Hindsight is 20-20 means when you look back, you can always see the mistakes. But of course, looking forward, it's, it's hard to tell. Um, so value objects is, is a pattern that uh, was not in the book. It's not in the book. Um, and the idea there, so how many people just have an idea of what, uh, of what the uh, value object is? So a few people do, but not, not too many. Uh, so these are, when you're having objects that are, you think of them as being immutable. You now, you actually have to set the variables when you construct them. So the constructors set the instance variables, but then once it's been created, you, you don't change those variables anymore. And this is a, a popular style. If you think of, of, uh, of, um, of like a date, date time object, you tend not to go changing the variables uh, on that. Um, when you have a value object, you don't What's important is equality. You want to know if these two values are equal. You don't really care about whether you're pointing to the same one. Uh, and it get, they get used in lots of places because the sort of lack of side effects means that you can share a lot better. So if you're having multi-threaded programming and you are sharing 
objects with states, then you have to synchronize them. If you're sharing value objects, it's no problem. Value objects, you can copy them. You want to write stuff out to the disk. You want to send them over the wire uh, in a distributed system. There's a lot of reasons that these value objects, but in fact, they model things like, like numbers. If you were having um, not, not a normal number, like a polynomial, I mean, you don't you think of uh, x squared plus 3x plus 4 as a value is a, uh, is a thing in and of itself. And when you say I want to add something else to it, you really are going to get a new polynomial. You don't think of, of, of changing the old one. So uh, there's a lot of places where this value object is, is the normal way. It's sort of the right way to think about things. Uh, a no object is... Uh, really just a sort of programming trick. Uh, we use null a lot in programs. And we end up writing code that looks like that. We say, well, if this object is null, then we have to do something. But normally, uh, we'll, if it's not null, then we'll call some function on it. But what, what if null were really an object in the same type as, as this OBJ? Then you could just say this, and if no, if, if the value of OBJ happened to be no, then it would go off and do the, the error result. It would, it would do that for you. And so if you have if your code is littered with these references to no, then you can actually simplify things a lot by making a class that means null to you. Making a class that's part of that. So you make a null object that implements the interface. And this fits in with the other patterns because what you'll see in when you build a, a class hierarchy, so there's a composite pattern. You said we had these composite arts, and there's a decorator pattern. We often use composite and decorator together. You're making different subclasses for uh, different patterns, and you would, you would have a null object. Um, that means that now when you say you have a, a part, the part will never be the value null. It's, it might be null part, which is a real object. Null is not a real object. It's a, you know, some special thing in your language. Um, so anyway, that's, it, it fit, no object actually fits well with the other patterns in the book. That's sort of why we feel, ah, we, we missed that one. That was one that I have been in there. It's almost, it's very simple. It's not very complicated. Um, but, um, and it was very, I mean, it was maybe not the very first plot. In fact, I think it was like the second plot. Uh, because the book had come out, and people look at that and said, hey, these guys missed this one. And so, and so they, they, they published it. Uh, no lie. Also, another way of looking at the patterns is to say, how do people misuse patterns? And there were, you know, there's sort of a shock to me how people would read the book, and they seemed like they were pretty intelligent people, and they would read the book, and then they would do the stupidest thing. And, and they would sort of think, well, I'm doing it because the book said to do it. <laughs> well, we had no idea anybody would do something like that. Um, and, and, and Mediator is one of those. Um, and, but I mean, both Mediator and Singleton are ones like that. And, and it, I can remember, again, this is just uh, maybe two years after the book came out, three years, not very long, and, and being at a conference and someone saying, oh, they love the book, it's wonderful, they're, they're, they're putting these things in and already within their system, they are like using Singleton 20 times and, and using Mediator a dozen times. <laughs> and these are, these are the only two patterns they mention. And uh, it's, uh, anyway, I, you know, my, my reaction, which I didn't follow because I'm a pretty nice guy, uh, but my reaction is uh, you're coming with something wrong. Uh, how can you be so stupid as to be doing that? So, uh, singleton is supposed to be used to uh, encapsulate global states. Global state bad. Everybody knows it's bad. What's happened? People use singleton was it would somehow be some magic that they could use to make global state good. And so rather than trying to get rid of it, or if you have to have it, being able to try to manage it with this pattern, they would they use this pattern to bless global state. Somehow it's now going to be a fine thing. So whenever somebody would say, "Well, we're using singleton 20 times, we've got 20 singletons in there." It's just, to me, it's almost inconceivable how how they do that. But uh, they were they were basically trying to use it as a, uh, a way of making global state good, and it doesn't. It does not make global state good. Um, and the mediator 
Uh, mediators is an interesting example. So, so uh, because to me, mediators are always ugly. They're always an adapter. Adapters, adapters are always ugly. Mediators are always ugly. But there's a purpose behind them. And if you use them for their purpose, then it's worthwhile. And you have sort of encapsulated the ugliness, and you've given a name to it. So when I'm reading somebody's code and they have a something or another adapter, I don't expect it to look good. Now, I'm, I know that it's an adapter because it's trying to reuse something that wasn't really meant to be there, and it's, it's trying to convert from one interface to another interface, and, and that's fine. And, and adapters are usually pretty simple when you figure out what's going on, but they're, they're never beautiful. Uh, and mediators the same way. So the purpose of a mediator is that you've noticed, you've got this, we think of the reusable class hierarchy, and then you, you, you built an application, you build another application, and what happens is as you go from one application to the next, trying to reuse these classes, that you will end up changing the classes over and over again. You change these classes that you want to be reusable. Sometimes you will subclass this one, and that one, and that one, and that one, or so you'll be using subclassing each time, or maybe you'll actually go in and add some code to the classes, but they're not being as reusable as you want them to be. And you, and you look at that and you say, well, the reason why they're not is because they have to communicate with each other. They are, they are, there's, there's some um, pattern of communication that changes every time. And so you say, well, what we'll do is we'll add a new class. We'll add a mediator. And that mediator will have the part that's different every time. So now when I want to make a new application from my old class library, I'll have to write a new mediator, but I can reuse all those other classes. So that's when mediator works. That's when mediator is good. But what people often do is they will have all these simple classes. They often just have data, don't really have any behavior. And then they'll have this one mediator, and they just put all the code in the mediator. And this is, this is more common in the past than it is today it was common in the past when people were didn't know how to do object oriented programming and now they're trying to do object oriented programming so they build all their records become classes and then their mainline program becomes this big giant mediator class um, but uh, we still see people today who have put all the logic in one place and they they call that a mediator and say eh, I mean, since it is a mediator but it isn't solving the purposes. It's not making these other classes reusable. And mediators, like I said, are always are ugly. Um, and if that ugliness makes all the rest of the code be reusable, then it's worthwhile. But if if not, then you're 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 not getting anything from it. So anyway, these are both patterns that. Uh, I've rewritten Singleton. I've got another version of the Singleton pattern that I think does a really good job of uh, preventing all the mistakes that people were making. Uh, I haven't done that with Mediator. Um, but there's, there's a... It, you know, it's easy as an author to blame yourself and say, oh, I should have I thought of that. I should have thought of that. But you can't predict how people are going to interpret what you do. We had hundreds of people read the book before it got published. We had lots and lots of people uh, give us feedback. So we had a mailing list that I think like 500 people on the mailing list. Now only 10% only of the people on the mailing list actually posted anything. That's very typical. You have a lot of people who read and a few people who actually uh, help you. Uh, we, we didn't have know about writer's workshops, that was sort of a technique that we learned after the book, but we had lots of friends besides the mailing list, we had friends who reviewed, and Addison Wesley provided a bunch of reviewers as well. And I know that John Vasides had people inside IBM, lots of people, so we had lots of people giving us feedback, and we still missed a lot. And that's just the way it is. It's, it's complicated, it's hard to get everything right. Uh, so. Um, I mean, it's important to be able to use the feedback when people start using your work and then you discover things that you didn't explain very well uh, to, to, to come back and, and fix them. And so we, we, can, we can sort of get mad at ourselves for missing it, but I think it's just inevitable. It always is going to happen. Okay, so uh, one category uh, that worked pretty well was creational. And the, the five creational patterns are uh, abstract factory, which is not a real important one, perhaps. Uh, factory method, prototype builder, 
and Singleton, and Singleton was often misused. But I think in this place, it's not like it's, people often say it's a bad pattern. Uh, I don't think it's a bad pattern. It just needs to be used properly. Anything is bad when you use it improperly. And the question is, when should patterns be used properly? When should they not be used? Um, that's, uh, but there's a, a pattern that has become popular since the book came out. Uh, is dependency injection. And this is a key idea. It changes things. Uh, so like factory methods get used a lot less. Uh, a single thing gets used less. These sort of ways of avoiding uh, dependency injection is ways of avoiding these other uh, patterns. Uh, the other patterns that you know, it doesn't uh, it doesn't change everything, but it, 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 it's had a big impact. Yes. Yeah, I think that I really miss on the creation of patterns. It's a a, a really a fundamental factory uh, pattern. Like for example. I want a method that I can return subclasses, for example. And uh, uh, I think uh, uh, it misses to have this basic concept because abstract factory and factory method are more specific problems. And just like I want to delegate the creation of, of an object as a pattern. Right. So, so the way I do it, uh, I talk about uh, a factory method versus a factory object. And a factory object is, a, is an object that you call to create more objects. And both uh, abstract factory, builder, and, and the prototype are all examples of those. But in a language where classes are objects, the class is a factory object too. So there's a lot of ways where you get, and there's other kind of factory objects that aren't any of, of these. So that's the notion of having a, a factory, or an object that makes things for you. Yeah, but the factory it. method is, is simpler than that because you, you only yeah. have a single method that you call. So it's limited in what it can do. Uh, but it's also very easy to implement. You don't really have to think much to do factory method. When you start having factory objects, you have to start thinking more and designing uh, more uh, for them. But then there's all these different routes you can take, whether you're going to go with you know, builders or prototypes or, or, or whatever. And there's probably, I mean, you should probably have more, but that's always a, a problem in any book. You're limited by space and how many things are you, and, and time. Are you going to publish the book or are you going to keep on uh, writing to it? But what I do when I, I'm teaching that is that uh, I pick up, uh, I, I forgot the name of the book, uh, that's talking about uh, good, good, Java practices that talks about the static. Scott Myers book. What the? Effective Java. Effective Java. Effective, effective Java. Java. Yes. Yeah, that, that, book. that talks about the static factory method uh -huh. as a pattern. Uh -huh. So I started with that and said, for example, that singleton is a, a a more specific example of that, yeah. and then I go to the other kinds yeah. of yeah. factory. Mm -hmm. But I miss this basic thing that uh, I think people uh, just this concept of uh, delegating the creation of an object mm -hmm. so if you have core patterns then you have patterns that aren't core mm -hmm. and uh, we have these peripheral, so there's the creational ones, which I say are a well-defined category. You can tell if it's creational or not creational pretty easily. But the ones that work core, uh, we were thinking of a common peripheral. Um, so like the visitor is one of the patterns that people write papers about the most. I bet there's more papers written about the visitor because the visitor's hard and it, it is it the first time you see visitor as an object of programming. Uh, programming, you, the first time you see visitor, it, it makes your head hurt. It, it's sort of a weird way of doing things. And when you understand it, then you understand polymorphism better. It sort of tricks with polymorphism. So I'd say visitor is probably the hardest pattern in the book to understand. Yes, it actually isn't used that often. So when you're building compilers, when you're building language processors, so you're doing compilers, uh, my group does refactoring tools, then visitor is very useful. But if you're just doing general business programming, visitor isn't really all that useful. Uh, it gets misused a lot because people read it and it's cool, right? You, 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 you read it the first time, you don't understand it. You read it the second time, you start to understand it. You talk to somebody, you go back, read it again, you try to program it, and suddenly the lights go on and say, oh, wow, 
that's amazing you can do that, but I want to use that in my program. You try to figure out some place you can use it, and so you, you, you come up with something that's not really very good. Oh, I can use Visitor. Oh, I remember really, this is cool. And you know, and a lot of times, so a lot of uses of Visitor, just not really a good idea. A lot of misuses. But in fact, it's, it's a sort of a rare pattern. And, and in terms of how many times it's misused, uh, Singleton uh, and Mediator are misused way more, more often. Um, but um, and it's, 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 it's the, a bridge is funny because it's very common in C++. And yet it's not used much in other languages. And that's something that I still I wrestle with. Why don't we use it much? And I think a lot of it is um, it's often used to overcome uh, static type checking rules. And then other, like, a lot of other languages are like that. But Java is static type checking, and it doesn't get used as much there. So I'm not quite sure. Uh, chain of responsibility. Uh, most of the time, chain of responsibility is used is when you're using a deposit pattern build this tree and, and you're going up the tree and, and you give every every node in the tree it, it could either handle the request or it delegates it to the, the parent. Uh, and so I wonder is it really worthwhile having a separate pattern? I mean there are cases where you have a chain of responsibility without using composite, but I bet 80% of the time it's part of composite. Is it really worthwhile having well we wrote it in the book so we're not going to pull them out so we're going to uh, these are patterns that we have written that people who are doing adaptive object models all love, type object, and so that's something that's been popular there, but uh, not really that widely used outside of there. Uh, extension object was something that Eric wrote about. Uh, actually, it's used in Eclipse in very cool ways. Uh, generation gap is something that uh, John Vecini wrote about, and we will keep it in the book in, in memory of him. Or we'll put it in the book and then we'll think it's not in there. <coughs> there also are, are patterns that you can actually think of as being uh, composed of other patterns. And, and when people are talking about pattern languages, they, they get into this a lot more. In fact, when we were writing the book, one of the things we tried to avoid doing was saying this pattern is made up of this other pattern. We didn't want to talk about that. We just wanted to present patterns. We didn't want to talk about theory of patterns and how patterns are related to other patterns. And, and our, this is something motivated by what Kent Beck had said, which is that uh, programmers always want to go meta. We always want to like, do something at a more abstract level. And that, that sometimes we just need to focus on, on the concrete details before we go meta. And it's fine to go meta eventually, but we often need to just focus on the facts more and just, just do programming. Um, and so the question is abstract class. Well, is abstract class a pattern uh, or, and at the time, there really were no programming language like in Java, abstract class is part of your language. You just said, this is an abstract class. And, that's it's part of your language, but it's not really in C++ when people say, say, when you have pure virtual uh, functions, that that's, that's a, but, but you can actually have abstract classes that don't have pure virtual functions. From small talk, from other dynamically type language, uh, abstract class is just a design technique, but it's not something built in the language at all. Um, and so we could say it's a pattern, but if we made it a pattern, it would be like almost every pattern would have an abstract class in it, and so we'd have to talk about and so that's, uh, that, that this pattern contains that pattern, and we said, no, 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 we don't want to do that, we don't want to do that, so we're not going to make abstract class be a pattern, because if we did, we'd have to talk about it. But this is 20 years ago. I mean, it's, now it is fine to talk about how one pattern contains another pattern, and that's, that's the way the world really is. Um, and some of these patterns, I think, can be described that way. I'm not going to go into them. Hey, Ralph. Yeah. Wouldn't you agree that flyweight flyweight is one I hardly rarely ever see implemented very right? yes. much. Yes. So and, and, and it's there, almost like uh, it doesn't even belong anymore. I mean, it's more like an optimization type pattern or something uh, for performance yeah, or I mean, for space. Or, it, it is an optimization. So, so the book, the the, the book is uh, title of the book is design patterns, elements of reusable uh, object oriented. Uh, software programming uh, yeah. design. I can't remember what, what the word is. But the point is, that reusable. Is it? Reusable is part of the title there. Uh, and and 
At the time we put it in, it was put in as much for advertising purposes as anything else. If you'd ask me, why is, why are these patterns about reuse, I really couldn't have told you. At the time the book was published, I really couldn't tell you that. What we knew was that we got these patterns by looking at reusable software. And so we, we sort of thought that these patterns were about reusable software. I can actually tell you a lot better now, 20 years I can tell you a lot more the different patterns, why they make software be reusable. But in fact, Flyweight does not make your, your software. It's not at all about how to make your program be more reusable. And in that sense, it doesn't fit. Most of the patterns are about making your software more reusable, not, not Flyweight. Uh, so that's kind of what Joe is saying. Uh, but it also, it's got all these parts to it. And what happens is people will only use a couple of the parts. So they'll pick one part and they'll say, this is a flyweight. I'll say, eh, it's not really a flyweight. It's sort of like flyweight. But flyweight has so many parts, the odds that you're going to use all the parts in one program are small. And so it would, I think it would have been better, you know, I mean, I'm agreeing with Joe, if we talked about the individual parts as individual patterns. And then, of course, there is this one combination of using them all together that's called flyweight. Uh, the purpose of flyweight is to save space. It's, 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 it's a case where you you're just have so many objects in the system that you are, um, so many objects in the system that you are you know, takes too much memory and, and we're trying to save space. With it. So it is an optimization. And I think of it as more, when you're trying to use all these other patterns, you will get smaller and smaller objects, you'll have more and more objects, and you'll probably need singleton, or you might need singleton along the way. So it is related in the sense that we saw it, and the sort of systems we were looking at often needed this pattern, but it, it really sort of had a different, different purpose. And that, that tells you something. We got these patterns by looking at software, by comparing notes, because we looked at lots of different systems, four of us, we all looked at different systems, we compared notes, the things we agreed on, we all thought were important, went in the book, Something that Eric thought was really important and no one else thought was important did not go in the book. You know, and there were, there were lots of things like that. Um, and there's no, there's no great theory behind this. There's no great theory behind design patterns. It was based on observation. It was based on what we saw. And so, again, 20 years later, we, we can have more theory about what was important and what wasn't. But I really need to quit the time is hot and we found I wanted to say a few a few things that uh, that are issues to the book. So one of them is refactoring patterns and refactoring. Now, there's actually a little section in design patterns on on refactoring with patterns, but we did not want to tell people the right way to figure out the patterns is to keep your design simple, and then as it grows, as you're adding features, and you see you need to have a pattern, then sort of refactor to put the, the, the pattern in. We didn't want to tell people that, because an awful lot of people back then really believed in upfront design, and they wanted to think hard and come up with all the patterns in advance, and put the patterns in first, and we did not want to offend those people and make them you know, tell everybody our book was bad. So that was, that was literally why, because uh, I know that Eric felt very strong, like I did, that you really should try to keep your, your system simple and refactor. So there's a book, a Joshua Kurieski wrote a book called Refactoring the Patterns, where that's like the only thing in the book is that you can create all these patterns later on. Here's how you can refactor to create those patterns. And I think that that's, you know, patterns fit in very well with the, with the whole agile refactoring. And that, that, that usually are not the first thing when you're doing a simple system. You don't need most of these design patterns. As your system gets bigger and more complicated, then you start needing them. And the right way to think about it is to know how to put the patterns in uh, afterwards. Something that's clear, people read the book, and we say, well, these patterns are things that experts know. When you look at mature, object-oriented systems, you tend to see a lot of these patterns in them. So I want to make my program good. I'll put as many patterns as I can. This sounds logical. I mean, there's a certain amount of logic to it. But bad idea, bad idea, because the patterns aren't magic. They are solutions to problems. And, and maybe they aren't even the best solution. Maybe you don't have those problems. Or maybe, maybe they aren't the best solutions that you have. Uh, you know, so, so counting patterns is not really a measure of, of how good your, your program is. And the way I teach it, when I teach design courses, I tell people, here's a system, put this pattern. 
And then I say, is it better? And I, I find places where putting the pattern in makes it really worse. A, you, can't, you can't miss the fact that putting this pattern in here, you can do it, you can put that pattern in here, that makes your program worse. And after you see that a few times, you start to realize, okay, sometimes the patterns make it better, sometimes the patterns make it worse. They're just techniques, they're just tools, and you have to use them appropriately. And this is again, people then blame the pattern for when, when you use it wrong, we don't want to say, well, I was stupid, I shouldn't have done that. We say, oh, the pattern was a bad thing. Nobody should ever do that. No, you shouldn't have done it then, but sometimes else it might be, still be a good idea. And then there's sort of the reasons for patterns. Um, why we use certain patterns um, of, of reuse, of managing variability, uh, being able to decouple parts of the system so it's easier to change them, managing dependence between, uh, between parts. These are sort of reasons. Uh, I like the, the Heads First Job, uh, Heads First Patterns, Heads First Design Patterns book, because they actually go through the patterns and they, they don't talk about all the design patterns, they go through a set of them, and they give reasons for it. And, and again, I like the next version of the book to explain the design characteristics of the different patterns, so that how design principles get illustrated in, in the patterns more. And um, so I said, patterns are examples of principles is something that it'd be nice if we could see that more in the book. Um, the, a, a key idea in plot has been pattern languages has been not just individual patterns, again, lots of papers are individual patterns, but really trying to see how we use this whole set of patterns together for some purpose. And design patterns uh, is uh, it's not a pattern language. We don't try to be a pattern language at all. I've, in the past, at Everest, have tried to figure out how they fit in to especially making more reusable software, making frameworks. Uh, Don Roberts and I wrote a paper uh, at, which is at a plot, uh, evolving frameworks, which was, um, was probably 16 years ago. I'm not sure which plot that was at. Pretty like 97 or 98. Yeah, something like so, that. About 16 years. Ago, <laughs> uh, and uh, that's yeah, that's that's something I would like to go back and revisit. I, I still think the basic idea behind it is pretty good. And this sort of shows how design patterns come in. They're not the first thing you do when you design. They're, they're happening as you're trying to make your software be more reusable. Um, and, um, okay, so. You know, the, I think anything you do, if you look back on it, you can find ways you can do it better. But uh, I'm really happy to be a part of it. One of the things, I was the fourth person to get added to, to it, even though I'm third on the list because the names are not the order. Eric was the one who came up with the idea. And he got Richard, and they worked together for a while. There's a, a chapter in Eric's thesis that is these, a lot of these design patterns. Um, now it's in German. I don't read German. I have his thesis, by the way. But I, I don't read German. I can, I can look. It does look to me, as far as I can tell, it really does look like um, design patterns. But if I if I read German, I, I would know for sure. Uh, then Richard, uh, uh, Eric worked with him for a while, and then they got Richard involved, and they invited me to join us the last one. And I've been really happy being a part of that um, because it's had a big big impact on things. But of course, there's always things you wish you had done uh, differently. Okay. That's um, uh, a few more questions. Do you know how many copies were sold? We haven't hit a million copies yet. I think it's up to maybe 800,000 or 900,000. It's getting up there. They're doing about 20,000 a year. I think it's a little bit. Still 20,000, right? It's like the Harry Potter of your science books. <laughs> yeah. They're still selling 20,000 copies yeah. a year. It's just unheard of. Yeah, I, I remember 20 when, years later, when, when it hit, hit 700,000. Wow. And uh, that's so amazing. It's so I'm not, I, don't, I, I ought to get a, a total count. But now that it's down, it takes. takes uh, a while to get another hundred thousand. So, if I mean, I know that our plan to do a second edition was to do it in Java, and I mean, if we don't hurry up and get it done. Java would be. Are you still thinking of Java? <laughs> Are you still thinking of Java? We're still thinking of Java. Okay. Uh, I mean, I program more in Groovy than I do in Java. But uh, and there's a lot. Java is really ugly. You, you 
should at least have a few examples of programming pros in, in Groovy. Uh, Maybe, maybe prototype well, well, small thing, talk. The thing is that now, now Java has closures in it, and yeah. hopefully we'll get uh, uh, so maybe, by the time we get the book done, they'll probably finish out Java. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there'll be Java 9 by then. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that is, again, I'm, I'm an old small talker, so you don't have to convince me on those things. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, one, one thing I'm wondering is, uh, I was involved with uh, a conference earlier, and I was talking about refactoring, and then since functional programming is becoming so popular, I was wondering about how you guys thought about some of the patterns with from a functional side as well, well my, or have you my, thought about that? Yeah, one of my complaints, so, so, so uh, one of the people, we, we, we had somebody who, one person read the book, the entire book twice, and gave detailed comments on the book every time. So we had one person who actually did that twice. And he was a grad student in California, and the first time through, his main complaint was all we were doing was patterns for user interface design. It wasn't uh, very general. Well, well, he, second time around, he realized, yeah, this is a lot of more, much more general than that. I mean, he made this, and other people complain. I think your thing. examples we had a lot we of fixed, We fixed our examples, yeah, yeah. A lot of it was the examples. Yeah. But what he said was, there's a whole bunch of stuff about distributed programming uh, and concurrent programming that you guys don't talk about. And I said okay. to him, of course that's true, but we're not experts on that. And we're writing about what we know. And since this is something that really uh, is important to you, you ought to write about it. Well, that was Doug Schmidt. Yeah. You know? So he did. He wrote about those patterns. And this is one of the great things about uh, our book is it's cost other people to write about the patterns that are important to them so you get all this, this knowledge out there. So one area where I've been complaining for 15 years that there aren't patterns about it is functional programming. And the, the, program, the, the patterns in functional programming are different. They have the, a lot of their own unique patterns. And, and I think they would actually get their ideas out more if they would write about those, those patterns. Mm -hmm. But um, they're, they're different. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. One of the things about value object as a pattern is it's, it's a way of making object-oriented programming more compatible with functional programming. Because you're having these objects with, without any side effects. And, uh, Again, it's something in small talk that I've, ever since I've been programming in small talk, uh, there's parts of, when I mean, you have a big small talk program, there are parts of it that are functional. Yes. And, and that's just very classic. You know, not, maybe not every single system, but, but, mm -hmm. but large numbers of systems are like that. And so there's this balancing between the object-oriented parts and the functional parts. Rather than trying to do everything in one style, you have a, a couple of different styles. And, you know, a weakness in the object in the, in the functional languages is that when you do something that really needs state, they often have to, you know, it makes their program pretty complicated because it's not, not very good at that. Um, but, yeah. uh, a question that I have is that I see people, uh, uh, the, the reactions of people maybe when they read the book for the first time is that, uh, as you said, uh, you try to uh, put patterns on separated things and don't uh, make many relations on them. Okay. Yes. And uh, people are like, I'm going to use this pattern and don't think about, ah, this is my design, I'm going to combine these patterns to, yeah. Yeah. to uh, reach a, a, a suitable solution. So, so we have in, in, in every pattern in the book, at the very end, we talk about related patterns, and we talk a little bit about how they're connected. And then there's the back cover, where we have that big picture with all the patterns pointing to each other. Those were all written in the last couple of months of our project. We've been doing this for two and a half years. We had a publication date before us, and we knew we had to make it. We are saying, we really ought to talk about how these patterns are related to each other. OK, then let's do that. And it happened very fast. Um, we really ought to have, you know, two years later come out with another edition only focusing on relationships between patterns. That probably would have been easier to do. And then, because that's really one of the weakest parts of the book. And because we just didn't have time. We, were, we had focused so much on the patterns, we knew we should talk about the relationships between them. Uh, and of course, experience tells you a lot more about the relations than, than just thinking. And you can imagine, and, and 
you miss too much. When you look at what people do, then it's much easier to see them. So it's actually much easier to talk about that now than it was when you wrote the book. But yeah, I agree with you. That's a weakness in the book. And, and how do how you, you imagine in this new version uh, to work this relation, to, uh, to present it for the reader? Yeah, so I'm not sure how useful that picture is, but one of my weaknesses, and when we did the writer's <coughs> workshop, somebody said, oh, you really have to have pictures. When I read people's papers, I just skip all the pictures. Uh, I, I'm very much a formula person. I'm very much an English text person. And it's hard for me to write pictures. So I never use uh, 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 object-oriented design languages until we wrote the book. And the other three were so much into all the pictures. John Massey's in particular, very meticulous with the pictures. I said, this book's going to have my name on it. I have to understand what these pictures mean. So I forced myself to learn the pictures. That was OMT. UML is so much like OMT. UML is easy for me. Once I knew OMT, I can switch over to UML. Except when I actually draw the, the picture, sometimes I use one notation, I shouldn't use the other. But, but, so now I understand those pictures very well. But to me, it's not natural. I am much more a, a word person than a picture person. Um, but, I know that a lot of people are much more picture people than they are word people. And so if you're going to write a good book, you're going to communicate well, you have to use all the different approaches. And, and we will have new pictures for that back cover. We will, we will do that. And it's, the way it's going to happen, though, is by writing more text that says, here's an example of how these things work together, and here's an example. And I, I can do lots of those now, because if you just... Uh, Joshua Karievsky has, he calls it pattern poker. Anybody seen pattern poker? Okay, so he gives a card deck, and, and everybody, you, you deal them out, and everybody gets like four cards or five cards. And when it's your turn, you have to come up with a design that uses all those patterns in one design. So it, it's, it's just a sort of a game to randomly pick patterns and put them together. And sometimes you know, the connection is not very good. But it's interesting how often you, you can take these three, well, I could use them this way, this way. And, you just, and if you've been designing a lot, you can just see those, those connections. And so we'll be doing that as we write about uh, the, the uses of, of it, and then from that we'll be able to derive the pictures. That's how I, I'm expecting it, because that's the kind of person I am. I do the text first, and I do the pictures later. Other people do pictures first and text later, but um, yeah, we, we'll end up with the picture. It's going to be a lot more complicated than that one, the one we have now, obviously. Okay, so thank you very much. So uh, we advanced a little bit on the time.